Uh, welcome everybody to session three of this uh, Azure One Data Platform uh, innovation session. So we are, you've heard this morning all about SAP on Azure, all about modernizing your infrastructure on Azure, for your SAP infrastructure on Azure. Um, that was from our, our partner, Microsoft UK's chosen partner for, for that activity, Centic. And uh, we are Kugul. So we're going to talk to you all about uh, modernizing your SAP data and processes on Azure. Um, just, to, just to confirm there, that's, that's all about overcoming the challenges, bringing your SAP data across to Azure, and then unlocking the value of that data once in the, the Azure data and AI platform. Um, so um, you'll hear from us in session three, all about modernizing your data, and then a little bit later on in session four, about modernizing your processes, uh, some modern workplace initiatives uh, on the Azure uh, data platform. So uh, my name is Rob Freelove. I'm part of the delivery team here at Google, uh, and I'm joined by my colleague Prashant. Hello, everyone. I'm Prashant Patel. I'm part of architecture team at Google. As we go through the session today, um, you've got the chat uh, window running. So please drop any questions you've got. Uh, we'll, we'll address them live in the session. Um, we've got our some of our engineers and architects monitoring that feed to give you live answers also we'll pick up some some questions at the end either save your questions for the end or or or, or ask for us to elaborate further and we'll, we'll cover those We've got about 10 15 minutes uh, allocated at the end for those so I want to make this as interactive as possible so moving on so before we talk about modernizing your data, I think it's important that we talk about why it's important to modernize your data. So every organization can and should leverage data uh, and AI. Um, three main things to, to re main reasons for that. Firstly, for the process, process optimization, um, the cost savings and productivity that come, come about by, by modernizing your data. Um, enhancing your speed to market. So giving you the opportunity to develop your products um, and launch them to market faster. And finally, the ability to innovate your, your product offering or the way that products are offered to, to your market. So building new business capabilities, perhaps a digital offering. So that's that's why. And I'm sure in the roles that oh, in, in the roles that you, you all have, you're frequently hearing um, from your peers, your, your internal customers asking for their, their questions, how, how can I get data at my fingertips so I can make informed decisions rather than having to um, have long, arduous processes to get data prepared to make decisions, uh, a lot of hidden factories around that. How do we get to the single source of the truth? Often you have uh, teams working in silos rather than collaborating around, around a common source of the truth of data. Um, it's also about responding to questions about how people can be more self-sufficient with, with their data, getting access to data and, and unlocking the value of it, understanding insights from data, ask, answering questions using data without having to lean on um, a, a centralized department to, to, to pro process every step in that. And clearly with Industry 4.0, there's, there's, there's an obvious question and an obvious strategy that a lot of businesses are looking to unlock, which is how do we make our first baby steps towards AI? So we're going to talk about how we make access to data cheaper, how, we, how, how that can be done faster, and, and ultimately how you can get better insights from your data you buy through modernization. So um, the challenge, let's, if we've taken the decision to modernize um, our data platform, um, let's say our organization is heavily invested in an, an existing IT application footprint, which all of your organizations will have at some point. So we need to find a way to tap into this existing footprint, which will have heterogeneous data sets. You'll have different, you'll have structured, unstructured, you'll have different forms of media. And there's a need to meet an ever growing number of use cases. So I've just got some use cases on the screen here, um, just simple ones just to, just to visualize for now. So without having a scalable modernization strategy for your data, <coughs> It's really easy to end up with what we would call a tactical point-to-point -point integrations. So you can see there, every single use case from each system is met by one integration, one process that, that's had to be implemented. Um, and that's often termed as, as ETL uh, in, in, in the business. So why is this approach likely to fail? Well, it's going to cost more because you're integrating point by point 
rather than looking at the larger strategy. It's going to be slower to implement over a longer period of time. It's not going to be scalable to the, the growing needs of each use case and the growing number of use cases and the growing volumes of data and growing number of source systems. And it will not deliver the, the, the optimized performance that, that your business users expect either in the, during the, the processing time or the, or the end user access time to that data, whether it be a access to data or a BI solution. So what does a modern data a cloud uh, data platform look like? Um, well, today we're talking about modernizing using Azure. Uh, we are a Microsoft Azure partner, as a Centic you've heard from this morning. So we're going to talk about how this is made possible using Microsoft Azure, use it with your SAP data. And by developing a sustainable strategy for your, your data and your, and your AI platform, it will cost you less longer term. That's leveraging the, the platform as a service from Azure, as well as software as a service from Azure. It will be faster to implement because those platform services can be implemented much more quickly and much more agile. And it will be easier to scale because those services is an infinite volume of um, or capacity for, for, your, for your volume of processing or volume of data and number of use cases. And will therefore deliver you the opti optimized performance that your business needs. So, Throughout today and your onward journey through, through Azure, if you haven't already started that journey, here's four steps for you to, to think about as you progressively build out your modern data platform, if you, if you made the decision to do so. So identify your source system, ingest your data, curate it or transform your data, and then model and, and serve it, i.e. establish a common model from which to serve all your use cases to, to your end users whether it be your, your different citizens within your organization, you've got your uh, data analysts, your data scientists, your operational managers, your strategic reporting managers, et cetera. So that data storage, that's really important that you understand you have a data strategy as part of your modern data platform. So we hear a lot about the data, data architecture and data democratization. In reality, what this really is, is achieving, you achieve it by having some, some common standards and methods and locations for storing your data, different types of data, different levels of maturity of data. So different user use cases and user groups are going to need varying levels of, of data maturity, uh, structures of data, whether it be completely unstructured, semi-structured or fully structured, and, and some users will need access to a lot more historical data than others who just need the latest and uh, up to latest working year, month, week, day, etc. So the concept of a modern data platform is, is encompassed by the essence of your, your processes and your data storage, and then understanding your use cases that you need to serve to, to your business. So this, this concept will serve an unlimited number of, of uh, analytical and, um, and, and data-related use cases. Thank you, Rob. That was a good intro of what a modern data platform would look like as a concept. So now let's see how we can actually implement this. So, I think earlier you, you made a reference of ETL, wherein if you ever had to do this on on-prem or previously, we always did it, did it as an ETL approach. But I think with, with the new adoption of cloud, uh, it's, it's no more an ETL, it's an ELT approach, where you would ingest your data, curate your data, and then start driving your various use cases on top of your curated data set. So what you're looking at here is, is, a, is a reference architecture, which has which also been proposed by Microsoft. But over a couple of years, we have matured it uh, to a stage at what you see here, which will ultimately help you pick and choose the various services which are available on Azure to deliver this modern data platform. So if you quickly go through each box, I think once you have identified your source systems from where you want to ingest your data, uh, you, you would you would quickly spin up a service called Azure Data Factory, which would fulfill your ingestion needs. Now, Data Factory is a low code, kind of a low code platform, which is GUI based, quick drag and drop, uh, service using which you can connect to either your sources which are in on-prem or on cloud and uh, easily ingest data. And uh, you could also use Data Factory for orchestration purposes, which you will see in a further demo. Now, uh, once your ingestion is sorted, then you want to do your curation, which is the transformation bit, which is the T part in your ELT. So for curation, we have seen Databricks to be <clears throat> the best possible option which is available in Azure. Now, there are various reasons for that. A, Databricks, if you don't know, is a Spark-based big data uh, analytical platform, but uh, it's highly scalable. So you could start with 
a single node on day one and either you could set it to auto scale or scale it up to hundreds of nodes and uh, this really depends on your scale requirements is really driven by the volume of data or the time at which or how quickly you want to process your data and on top of that databricks also allows you to write language in five different uh, uh, programs like you can write code in python scala or r which meets your data science needs. But if you have your business users who are traditionally used to writing SQL queries to uh, interact with your data for day-to-day uh, -day on demand use cases, then it also lets you write uh, SQL queries, which is a Spark SQL. So you could ingest your data, whether structured, unstructured on lake, and you could write SQL queries to interact with that. Right. So that's your uh, data bricks for curation. And then for modeling, either you could use Synapse or you could use analysis services. But between these two, it will fulfill all your modeling needs. Now, uh, what we have seen is people have always traditionally used analysis services, which is now renamed as Azure Analysis Services. Now, one of the key benefit of using Azure Analysis Services for uh, modeling is it stores your data, model data in memory. So you get faster access to that from your Power BI reports. Now, uh, that's your uh, modeling. Uh, as I said, you, you could choose between Synapse or Analysis Services. And once you have modeled your data, then it's all about consumption. So you could, there are various ways how you could consume your data. We have seen people connecting through Excel directly to Analysis Services. You could use one of the industry leading BI tool like Power BI to uh, meet your uh, consumption demands and needs. Uh, there is also Azure Web App where if you want to visualize your data for any additional use cases, then you could always spin up Azure Web App, point it to the data store, and uh, you can start interacting with your data. Yeah. <clears throat> and now coming to the storage part, as you can see with, within storage, as you have seen now your data moved through various layers, like you ingested your data, then you created data, and then you model your data. So from ingestion perspective, as soon as your extraction happens and as part of your load in the ELT process, uh, our recommendation is always to data lake because it's cheaper to store your raw data and you can extend data lake to also store for your historical or archival needs and yeah. from there as part of your curation you can either choose to store your data curated data or model data in a data lake or you could also ingest that into synapse now uh, we have also mentioned here azure sql storage which is really used when you have your real-time reporting needs or any other complicated scenarios and one of such scenario we have actually covered in our further demo yeah so we'll see how uh, we have used these three different types of storages to deliver uh, use cases for and, our customers and throughout today we're going to see that security layer as well managed through through the end user use cases uh, absolutely and again security is out of the box with with, with azure wherein as you can see from from starting from left we have uh, virtual networks which you can deploy to secure your data or your resources or infrastructure uh, you could also segregate them under further uh, groups and have your ne network security groups created on top of that then you have key vault which is really used to store all your passwords uh, certificates tokens and we'll actually see how key vault was actually used along with azure SQL to uh, make your sensitive data even more secure on Azure. Then you have Azure Active Directory, which is your Azure AD. With, with, with AD, as, as you have done on on-prem, you could manage your resources directly on Lake, uh, access to your resources on Lake using Azure AD, but you can extend that further into web apps to see how you, your web applications or your mobile devices can uh, connect to the data stored on your data storage by successfully authenticating against Azure Active Directory. So it, it kind of provides you a seamless integration or, or a seamless security controls across all these services and data. And, and Prashant, this, what we're seeing here is very, very close to or, or taken from the Bond Data Warehouse concept from, from Microsoft. So, and we can see here, there's a number of sources on the left-hand side uh, that we've identified, but with today being about SAP data or this session being about SAP data and how you can bring that into Azure and then benefit from it. How would this solution work with complex data ingestion from, or oh, sorry, data ingestion from complex databases like SAP? Yeah. Yeah, so th this is where I said this, this reference architecture is quite close to what Microsoft has proposed, but we have matured it over time, over past three years. This has matured and grown a lot. And uh, one of that is to deal with SAP data. Now, we all know, or at least my personal experience with SAP data, having worked with 
uh, ingesting data into SAP, master data management of SAP, or even integrations to SAP. What I have known and I would have seen is uh, SAP data is really gold. Uh, everyone wants it but it's not easy to access yeah. and uh, that is where using our past experience having dealt with SAP we have created a product called Velocity which helps you ingest data from SAP both in batch or full mode or in your CDC or in your near real-time scenarios. Now uh, this also cuts through across various SAP estates like ECC, S4, BW, uh, EWM, APO, so on and so forth, and it also cuts across various data sets which SAP has internally, like complicated ones like uh, tables, cluster tables, pool tables, T codes, BW extractors, you name it, all those are supported through Velocity. So we use Velocity to ingest data from complex systems like SAP, and then we use Data Factory to also ingest data from uh, other sources like uh, Salesforce, Workday, so on and so forth. Now, additionally, you could also use Velocity to curate your data. Now, uh, it gives you a graphical user base tool where you can define your curation logic, save it, and it automatically creates Databricks code in the background and execute that for you. So and we're going to see a little bit of that. And so you're going to see yeah. that. In a okay. Bit. Yeah. Okay. So, um, kind of end of our introduction here. So, as we get in towards our our before we go in towards our demo, probably worth just to share some some guidance and that we always share with our our customers and partners is if you're planning your, your next move, plan start by walking and then then try then, then move towards running. If you start running without warming up, without learning how to take those first steps, then um, then you can trip over. So and, and that's what this reference architecture also helps you with it. With with the same architecture, you can start walking and then you can slowly start running. But yep. you don't have to change your architecture, which I think you'll you'll show anyway in, in the subsequent sessions. Great. So we're gonna we're gonna start with something simple today, and then we're gonna build on it as as this session goes goes yes. through. Okay. So um, it's almost time to get started. Great. So I'll make sure. yep. <laughs> So um, we're gonna take a look at some worth examples for uh, an Azure modern data platform today. Um, Please, um, if you have any questions on what we've already talked through through the introduction, just drop them into into the chat, and we'll, we'll be sure to jump right on them. And we can also address those questions at the end. Um, we're now going to take a look for the next kind of thirty minutes at some uh, worth example. We're going to go start with a simple use case and work through to to what we might call run mode, following our walk run approach, um, adding progressively some capabilities to, to our platform. So the way we're going to do it, we're going to show you something. And show you the value of it, and then we're going to talk talk a bit about, and maybe in some cases demonstrate how how we uh, how we configure the services on the platform to on the Azure platform to to deliver it. So uh, reminder: any questions as we go through, please pop them in. Okay. So for our first use case, um, I'm I'm joined by Will. Hi, Will. Hi, Rob. Uh, I'm Will. Will Huang. I'm part of the architecture team here at Google. Welcome, Will. Our first use case is. Um, analytical reporting on SAP data sets. So, start us off, we've got some um, standard reports we've created in Power BI. Um, you can see some management accounting in here. So, um, we're reviewing aggregated general ledger data from S4HANA, uh, this AC DOC A table, and this is modeled against their dimensional data for the, um, the, the, the our chart, chart of accounts. So, we've got um, our GL nodes, and we've got the time dimension in here, so to give it uh, more, to give the data more insight. You see there that we toggled the, the currency. We've got the ability to, from um, pounds to US dollars, we've got the ability to toggle the, uh, the the time dimension that this data is aggregated against. Also, so start off with a simple report here, um, quite performant. Next up. We've got a uh, financials various analysis report um, here. looks a bit looks a bit similar to the last report, but we've got some additional dimensions within here. Um, so we've got our SAP general ledger data aggregated again by our general ledger accounts down the uh, on the y-axis. Um, you can see here quite performant reports as we as we toggle the uh, toggle the um, the filters at the top and the slices. And then we can also see how that's got how we've introduced a location um, axis to this across the x-axis. Uh, and as we drill down, we're seeing will some some good performance in the report. So what's really going on here? Uh, so what we're looking at here is a Power BI report, uh, which is connected to a data model in Azure Analysis Services. 
So uh, the speed of the report is really driven by the power of uh, Azure Analysis Services here. Uh, it's got the ability to to uh, work on uh, huge data sets in, in tens of billions of records uh, and to perform thousands of queries on that uh, at the speed of thought. Great. Uh, so what you can also see here is uh, drill through functionality, which provides uh, visibility uh, on a more granular level. So from your aggregated data, you can drill through right to uh, your sales of each particular material. Fantastic. So clearly with those reports, if we wanted to scale this solution out to a, a wider user group, need to introduce some sort of data and security based uh, measures, right? Yeah, of course, that's right. So um, you'll always want to secure your data and uh, the reports and the users accessing that report. And so what we're seeing now uh, in this demonstration is a user signing in uh, with uh, the, his Active Directory credentials. And we'll see how the content of the report can be automatically filtered based on the uh, access levels of that particular logged in user. So this is uh, driven by role level security uh, in anal Azure Analysis Services, uh, which restri restricts the uh, visibility of certain rows of the data sets, depending on the, uh, the access level of that configured user. And if we just stop here, we can see Ben, fictitious member of our, or real member of one of our fictitious Yorkshire branches, <laughs> has logged in and can see just content from, from that. Uh, finance data only related to that location, so that's what you're referring to with the with the role level security bill. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, an Azure Active Directory group, uh, which Ben is a part of. Um, it's allocated to our Yorkshire branch, so it means that when lo Ben's logged in, uh, he can only see data pertaining to that particular branch. And next up, we've got uh, Saba. We can see working. Um, Again, entering a credential straight into um, into Power BI here. She works in our Coventry office. That's a real office, and her her view of these reports should be limited to Coventry. There we go. Yeah, and, and uh, what's what's awesome about this is that both Ben and Saba uh, are accessing the same report using the same data model, uh, but the the data is dynamically changing based on just their user user credentials. And now we have got a uh, geospatial representation of this financial data. Again, this is in, in Power BI. Yeah, so what we've done here is we've uh, enriched the same data set uh, and the same data model with additional geographical data. Uh, so this, this is in, in terms of polygon files, which map to your organizational context. And so really what you can do here is you can you can set your custom polygons or boundaries for your organization and then just overlay your, your organizational performance. Yeah. Straight and from your SAP data. Yeah, of course, of course. And as you can see, these these uh, geographical regions can be customized with uh, conditional formatting as well. So uh, based on the data in the model, uh, just to enable uh, drill throughs. Uh, so you can see, for example, here, uh, which are the problem areas uh, and then drill into it and then see that data at a more granular level. Fantastic. Just wrapping up here with a, with closing out this demo, we can see that very same report, uh, that income statement report, but this time it's being accessed by by uh, our user Ben from Yorkshire in Teams, right? Yeah, so Azure and Power BI in general have a really good integration with all of your Office 365 applications. So uh, this really improves the overall user experience. Okay, so that was a bit of a um, glossy about what's possible mm -hmm. but really we brought this this is all about how we make it possible so how how organizations can take their sap data and and, and gain these types of insights on on, on azure so um will i'm going to ask for <laughs> some help from you here to be able to, to talk us through that again that that four stage process of how we uh, how we took the data from source ingested it curated it then modeled and served it um, in azure so over to will talk us through What's going on now, starting with the, the ingestion of the SAP data? Uh, yeah, so for this uh, demonstration, this what you're looking at here is the Velocity tool. Uh, and so the Velocity tool is, uh, is a web-based tool. It's used to configure and manage your SAP data extractions. Uh, so we start off by um, establishing a connection to your source systems. Uh, as uh, Prashant mentioned earlier, this could be SAP ECC, this could be uh, SAP SAP BW, uh, it can extract many different types of, uh, of, of tables, um, 
uh, or, or T codes, for example. Or you can extract from other database systems, for example, your on-prem Oracle databases or other SQL Server databases. Uh, once we configure our data sources, uh, you'll see that uh, we can uh, configure the, the table to extract here. Uh, for this example, we're configuring uh, uh, your AC doc A table to extract. Uh, and as you can see, all of this uh, configuration is used using a very user-friendly form. And I saw just in that table there, Will, we had something called delta selected within that within that table. Yep, so uh, Velocity, as, as Prashant mentioned before, can uh, can manage the replication and merging of all of your of your delta uh, extracts from from uh, from SAP to Azure. So your team doesn't really need to worry at all about uh, syndicating that data to any of the target platforms, whether that be your data lake or straight through to Azure Synapse. Great. Okay. Uh, so once the table extraction is complete, as you can see here, the data is stored in the data lake, um, and this is neatly uh, neatly categorized into the different levels of maturity uh, for those ingestions, so raw curated, uh, and then uh, you just saw there um, that it was separated into different source systems, and you can see the data for the uh, AC doc A extraction uh, in Parquet format uh, here. Okay, so we've seen now the ingestion of data from from SAP. We saw our AC doc A table there, in it sat in the data lake in Park A format. Um, next process or step is to curate and clean the data. So, so what happens here, Will? Uh, so. Uh, uh, as uh, Prashant mentioned before, we, uh, for our reference architecture, we're using uh, Databricks to curate this data. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the Velocity tool, we're looking at the uh, data that's already been ingested by the Velocity tool. And there are two things to notice here. Um, one, that the Velocity tool automatically created the uh, Databricks tables for you to uh, on the ingested data. And two, we've also uh, got the English descriptions to all of those SAP columns too. And what that means is that your users can can interact with this data without having to uh, understand the, the 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 SAP German acronyms for all of the different columns. Great. So that's a head start in the uh, in the curation process to begin with, right? Yeah. Uh, so here you see uh, this Databricks notebook that we're using to curate the data. Um, so we're uh, we're aggregating the AC doc A raw data sets, and then this is this will be saved to your data lake in the curated folder. And you, this is written in SQL. Yes. Yeah, so this this particular notebook's written in SQL, which means that uh, your your data engineers uh, don't have to really uh, learn a new language to interact with this data. But if you've got any any uh, any data scientists who are familiar with uh, Python or or R, uh, then they can use that too. Great. And we've just talked about AC Doc A as one table, but as part of your your end to end processes and delivering use cases, you're going to need to ingest num large volumes and large numbers of tables. So there's going to need to be some automation there. So, so how is this process automated? Um, so uh, if you need to do any transformations, the Velocity tool has a, has a GUI-based tool to actually transform your data. So what we're looking at here is um, join conditions, filter conditions that uh, you can configure from the Velocity tool. Uh, and then all of this transformation will be will be dealt end-to-end uh, -end by the Velocity tool. And that those transformation uh, logic that you've that you've uh, that you saw there will be automatically applied when you're ingesting the data. Great. Okay. So now our data is curated and clean. Next step from our from our four-stage process was to or, 4A is to build the data model. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so now that we've got the curated data sets into Synapse, uh, we can create our facts and dimensions for our analytics, analytics use case. So Synapse, uh, as you can see here, it's a, it's a big data analytics platform which works uh, on uh, your MPP uh, architectures, which is basically a massively parallel processing um, uh, and so Synapse will look at this data in the data lake, use its MPP architecture and, uh, and Polybase to fetch this data and then pull this into Synapse. So what, what real benefits is that massively parallel process bringing? So MPP uh, improves the execution time of your queries. Um, it, it, it can uh, serve very high volumes of data. 
uh, to end users, and it can scale to, as we mentioned before, billions of billions of records. Great. Okay. So we've tracked a process from extraction, ingestion, curation, um, and now we've seen at the, the, the beginnings of our data model within Synapse. This is for our finance uh, report and analytics. So what needs to happen next to be able to use that data that we saw originally from SAP in, into, uh, into Power BI World? Yeah, so next we need to uh, model our data. So um, from any of your data storage layers, uh, you can import this data into Azure Analysis Services for, for the creation of your semantic data model. Now, for this, there are, there are generally four steps. Uh, first is you create your data source. As you can see here, we've got SQL Server as a data source. Uh, then we can import our facts and dimensions, so the data from, the, from that data source, into, into a star schema. Uh, we then define our relationships. So uh, you've got your facts in the middle and, and your dimensions surrounding it. Yeah, um, and it's represented in this ERD diagram here, right? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, correct. Uh, and then once you have uh, this uh, this um, this structure, then you can define your different measures and KPIs against them, and all your calculations uh, using uh, using the DAX language. Yeah. Right here we go. So we can see here um, exchange rate. So in the previous report, uh, just a reminder for everyone, we saw a toggling. Uh, or switching from one currency, I think it was GBP, to US dollars. So is this, this where this was implemented, Will? Yeah, exactly. So the user selection on the Power BI report was driven by uh, this uh, calculation in, in Azure Analysis Services, uh, where your exchange rates could be automatically applied based on the filtering in the report. OK, so probably some people wondering why we need Analysis Services and why is it, how is it different to Synapse? How, how does it add value in that process? Uh, well, Azure Analysis Services is an, is an in-memory database which can store huge volumes of data uh, which are highly compressed to improve the read performance. So uh, what we've seen is that organizations are using this as a single source of truth for all of their reporting. So uh, a few data models uh, across the enterprise can serve all of your enterprise reporting needs. OK, thank you. And, and another key element of our analytical reporting use case was that row level security will. So um, just talk to us a little bit about what, how this is implemented. Uh, so yeah, the row level security is configured in the data model using uh, using uh, Azure Active Directory. So these uh, Azure Active Directory groups are, are used in security tables here, which are which will then limit the, uh, the, the rows or the data sets, uh, depending on that logged in user. So this is our security table. Mm -hmm. And you can see in this security table that there's a, a uh, DAX query here, which is very simple, which is used to, uh, to uh, limit the data sets. OK, so we've seen, we saw earlier, earlier in this session then some Power BI reports. And this session isn't really about Power BI. This session is about the, the Azure platform. and what we've seen over the last five to 10 minutes is how we've used those Azure services to extract the data from SAP and um, curate, model it, and then ultimately serve it so that we get those performance reports within uh, within the, the reporting layer or, or any other layer in which the data is accessed from, from this model, right? Okay, so that's the end-to-end -end process. How do we automate? that end-to-end -end process so that it runs on a, on a frequency that we needed to run and reliably? Uh, well, so you need a, an orchestration process. So um, here we can see uh, an Azure Data Factory pipeline. This is uh, quite simple to build. Um, so what we're doing here is we are uh, running the curation and then refreshing the model, uh, but in between we are we are logging certain steps. So if so, if a certain step has 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 been uh, has been successful, it will refresh the AAS model. If the curation hasn't been successful, then it will log that error for you and okay. then alert the users. So uh, also, this uh, this Azure Data Factory pipeline uh, has the ability to be scheduled. Uh, so often. Uh, 
this will be scheduled every hour or every couple of hours so that yep. your users get the, uh, the latest version of the report. Fantastic, Will. Thank you very much. A um, lot, lot we covered there in a short space of time across the, uh, those steps from uh, ingest through to uh, model and serve. Um, thanks for guiding us through it. Um, we'll just pause there again for, for everybody online. I uh, hope you're still following this okay. Um, please, if you do have any questions from what you've what we've shown so far, what we've talked through, please send them in. Um, and we're going to move on to our uh, next use case. So, next use case, uh, I'm rejoined back by Prashant. So Prashant's just coming back now. Um, it's really about a, a, a web application for for managing data. Um, so, um, welcome back. Thank you, thank you, Rob. So, uh, I think as you said, so in in this use case or session, we are going to demo a web app which uh, we have created for one of our customers to manage your data. Now, data man within data management, I think there are lots of different types of data sets which you could manage, master data, uh, reference data, for example, like exchange rates or currency conversions. Uh, in fact, exchange rate is something which you have already used in one of your previous use cases where yes. you demo. Right? So we are going to show how we have mastered that data using Azure Web App. Now, <clears throat> Before we start, let's just yeah. check that we're really clear what we mean by reference data then. Yeah, I mean, uh, the true definition of reference data is really data which is used to classify or data which helps you classify, categorize your existing data sets. Okay. So it's kind of a data which, which kind of gives a new dimension to your existing data sets. So, uh, and, and again, this is key part of your data enrichment process, uh, which ultimately ensures your data always remains complete. Uh, which is again a broader part of data quality where there are various dimensions of data quality, one being completeness, but you have timely consistency and accuracy of your data. And your data quality, as we can see on the, on this sheet here, is key yeah. part of your, your governance framework. Yeah, and, and, and then data governance is really a very broad topic, uh, which, which, which covers, which cuts through your process, people and technology. But in short, if I can summarize our data governance, then it's a formal process of collecting or acquiring your data, storing it, managing it, and making it secure. And uh, for me at least, this data enrichment or data management part falls under that managing bucket of data governance. Great, and, and, and for everybody following here, so we're gonna talk about a specific use case for, for data management. This is reference data management, in this case, using a, an Azure web app. Um, this, is, this is showing how Azure could be used, put to that specific use case, not trying to boil the ocean and solve a, a huge, data governance problem, <laughs> but solve specific challenges that... Yeah, that exactly, and, exactly. And, and, and here we are just trying to show with a small use case to say how you can quickly build and deliver something on Azure as part of your data management process, and you can very easily scale on that. Yep. So uh, I think what we'll show now is the demo, uh, or, or before that. Uh, Regarding reference data, again, this is something, if I take exchange rate as an example, that's something which you could very well manage or maintain on SAP, or you might have multiple systems managing that exchange rate data. So you end up having multiple points of, or source of truth for the same piece of information. And on top of that, when you try to add more reference data sets on your existing ERP systems, uh, we all know the cost and time to implement that gradually keeps going up but and, and then you start hitting the limits as well how much there is only yep. so much you can do with your on-prem system so what we really recommend and we have done for for this customer is we uh, implemented this uh, uh, reference data piece in Azure so it ultimately provides you an ability to add as many data sets as you want Right. So what you're looking at is kind of an architecture which we have used here. It's a very simple architecture. You have an Azure web app which is tapping into the data store which has data delivered by your modern data platform. And uh, either it is enriching that ex existing data set or adding new data set which can then be further used in your modeling layer. And yep. then ultimately it will be used as, a, as, as one of the dimensions in your serving layer. Fantastic. So let's move on to that demo. Um, yeah. We're going to use, we, we picked exchange rate data for, for this. Um, yeah, so, so what you're seeing is a user or a data steward here trying to log into the application. Now this application is uh, single sign-on enabled using Azure Active Directory. So user logged in, he was successfully authenticated and then he will be landed back to the main portal as you can see. And uh, once he lands onto the portal uh, on the top right side as you can see 
after successful authentication, there were certain attributes which are automatically pulled and uh, his name is uh, displayed on the right side. So there you go. Yeah. So what you're really seeing here is, uh, again, as I said, it's a very simple use case here. We have chosen exchange rate data. This is a data which was previously mastered. And uh, as you can see, you can easily add with a simple interface or change an existing exchange rate. And any change, create, delete you do is fully audited and traceable. So yep. there is a proper change history maintained. Yeah. Are these updates, where are they going then? So they're going back to the main data store where your data is delivered by your modern data platform. So it's like yeah. one place from where uh, you can drive your any use cases. Yeah, Great. it's one okay. central location, yeah. And then additionally, uh, we have added one data filtering feature here for the user wherein uh, the, the user wanted to control the data or filter the data sets which go into your analysis services model. So here they quickly uh, uh, defined a, a criteria to say on my this data set, uh, these are my various join and filtering conditions which I want to use uh, to filter my data. So for example, here they have uh, set up a, a condition to filter out data which is only created in this year and yep. it only pushes that data into your data model or into your analysis services model. So you, you, you have one place where you define your filters and again it's it's governed and it's audited. So you have full traceability of who changed what and at the same time you get the capability of controlling what goes into your model. Great. So yeah. this really creates a, a front end to your, your data storage that enables you to, to interact with that data and update or at least or, you know, update that data without having to have Excel sheets exported and then passed around and then moved back in. Exactly. And that's what they were doing before. They were trying to manage exchange rate in various Excel sheets and, and they lost traceability and they had too many Excels which they had to manage. So this kind of created that one central point for anyone to view, update or consume the data. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Prashant, for that demo. No, no problem. Um, so that's two use cases down. Um, now we might st feel like we're starting to pick up the pace. <laughs> uh, I'm certainly getting out of breath. So yeah. uh, moving into maybe a, a light jog, we're going to talk about integrations yeah. now. So thanks very much, Prashant. Thank you, Rob. I'm going to be rejoined in a moment just by Will. So integrations, um, as uh, Azure is not just about a uh, having um, reports and, and running analytics is all it's also possible to bring your data in and have it have it there as a hub right will mm -hmm. yeah that's correct uh, and so what we wanted to show you today was how quick and easy it is to integrate other data into into your azure platform beyond the sap data sets that we started with right yep yeah okay Please keep your questions coming as the, as the uh, session goes on. I think we're a little bit quiet in the feed so far. It must be uh, we're doing either a, <laughs> a great job or uh, or everyone's asleep. So we'll we'll try and liven up a bit. <laughs> All right. So what you're seeing here is uh, is an Azure Data Factory pipeline, and it's a really simple workflow for ingesting all of your Salesforce data. Uh, so here we're using a native uh, Microsoft connector, uh, as you can see in the screen. So uh, as mentioned by Prashant, this is a low code interface uh, to build a, a pipeline to ingest all of your Salesforce data within minutes. So what sort of pro experience do you need with Azure Data Factory to do this type of work? Well, you don't need uh, you don't need much at all. Uh, as you can see on the screen, it's a, it's it's GUI based, so it's a it's a click interface. Uh, and then once you've configured your Salesforce system and put input your credentials here, as you can see on the screen, um, it's quite easy to to build pipelines. Uh, based on this. So in this pipeline, uh, we're just showing a, a very simple process for looping through all of your Salesforce tables and ingesting that straight to, through to your data lake. Okay. So this is where the data is then copied to your data lake. Yep. So as you can see here, we've got a source system, which is your, uh, which is the Salesforce system that we've already configured. And uh, for the target, we are selecting the uh, the data lake here. And as you can see on the data lake, we've got uh, your your uh, folders all separated into your raw and curated. And you can see that your SFDC, uh, or sorry, your Salesforce data is ingested here. Great. Thank you very much, Will. 
uh, and so it's not just Salesforce data. Uh, Azure actually supports a, a plethora of different uh, data sources. So here, between Azure Data Factory and Azure Logic Apps, uh, you can see that all your common enterprise uh, applications are supported. Yep. So everything from your on-prem uh, Oracle systems all the way through to uh, Twitter data. So you can in ingest your Twitter data or any social media uh, data for sentiment analysis. OK, so let's look at some examples where we've ingested additional data sets across, complemented to complementary to the SAP data sets, um, and, and been able to build out a use case with them. All right, so this is a uh, this is a, an architecture for a modern data implementation of an identity hub. Now, um, uh, if you look to the left, uh, you'll see some of the highlights. Uh, we actually built two data hubs for for this implementation. Uh, the HR hub. Uh, which you can see at the bottom left there is used for more sensitive HR information. Um, so this includes uh, data encryption, uh, data masking, uh, and uh, this is all backed by your Azure Key Vaults as well. Uh, what this ensures is that even database administrators, who are normally highly privileged, can't actually access or see that data without having explicit permissions to actually read that data. Yep. Um, and on the, uh, in the middle there, you'll see the Identity Hub. Uh, and this will ingest uh, data from uh, from uh, from your on-prem or your Azure uh, identity sources, and including your HR systems or HR uh, uh, service providers like ADP. Uh, and then you can use this identity data to then serve uh, your data, identity data out to many applications. And. Uh, which downstream applications might you then support this to send this data to? Uh, so we've uh, connected this identity data to a number of different uh, downstream systems, uh, any systems you want really. Yep. Uh, for this case, we've uh, we've connected to, to uh, learning management systems, yep. for example, so you can manage your identity within your workforce training systems or um, your service request systems. So yep. if any of your employers are having any uh, any problems with 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 particular applications, then they can raise their ticket with the correct identity information. So your point there is that it's not just about integrating data by bringing data in, it's also possible to syndicate data out to other applications and systems. Yep, and okay. for this uh, use case, you can see that we've used Data Factory and MuleSoft, but um, if your organization uses any other integration tool, uh, it, it's it's very flexible to be able to get this data out yep. and uh, and serve any, any, any application you choose. Okay, awesome, thanks Will. Uh, let's move on. So this is an example of the, of uh, a customer uh, hub. So uh, this was built so that you could provide a 360 degree view of the customer uh, using your uh, ERP data sets and your non-ERP data sets as well. So as you can see here, we, uh, we're ingesting data from on-prem on Oracle databases, file-based systems, so SFTP, uh, and software as a service such as Salesforce. Yep. And we're, uh, we're uh, we're mashing that data up with the uh, SAP ERP data, and then once you've modeled and uh, once you've stored and then modeled that data, uh, this data can be, then be used for uh, predictive analytics. Uh, so, for example, uh, for this use case, we were predicting the customer churn month to month. Oh, great! And we're going to see a small demo on that shortly. So, mm -hmm. um, just just to pause there. So, we've seen ingestion of SAP and non-SAP data now. Um, so. Really important. Once you've got that data there, you, you may have common objects. They need modeling, right? So, so how does this model demo? Okay, so there are actually uh, many ways to model your data, uh, but for this particular use case, we use the Data Vault two modeling concept. Uh, so this is a uh, this, what you're seeing here is a high level representation of the Data Vault concept we that we used. It uses. Uh, it uses SAP data sets, so you can see your AC doc A here, uh, again, in line with your uh, Salesforce data sets. Uh, and the reason why we use Data Vault 2 is because it's highly scalable and it's very agile, which means that the customer can then add extra data. So uh, what would normally be quite a laborious process of adding uh, an extra column to a table, uh, this data model is very flexible so that uh, you can add more data sets, add more attributes without actually uh, affecting any of the existing data that you've already ingested. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Clearly, that means you can get something going very quickly and then build on it from there. So uh, that's two use cases here then, everyone, for uh, integration and purpose of showing these is just to show that Azure can be a data hub as part of your modern data platform. So thanks a lot, Will. 
let's move on to um, our final use case. Um, so we're three down. I think we're probably in, in our run mode now from our warp run analogy earlier on. So um, last use case, we're going to demonstrate from the previous use case how we might take might have taken that customer data that was modeled um, from multiple sources, SAP and Salesforce, um, and then um, deliver some predictive analytics capability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with your data science use cases, Azure actually offers many uh, different services to serve okay. this purpose. Uh, for for this uh, use case, we're using uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio, which is a user friendly GUI based uh, GUI based uh, software, uh, which you can use to create, train, and deploy your mm -hmm. your machine learning models. What's yeah. this? Well, okay. So, what you're looking at is uh, the Azure Machine Learning Studio interface. Uh, you'll see that it's a, a very user-friendly interface that you can use to create and train your models. So the first step for us is to uh, import the data to be used for the model. Uh, and here we've used the customer data for the predictive modeling. Uh, you then split the data. So uh, what we've done is we've split this into an 80-20 ratio, 80% to uh, train your model and then 20% to evaluate your model. And what we're what we're looking for here is the churn or the or the retention of a customer, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, you can you can uh, once got new data sets in, you can train your model. Uh, this model is then scored. Uh, you can then evaluate uh, the the predictive modeling there uh, in terms of accuracy and precision. Uh, and then finally, you can export the data uh, to be used for analytics. So there was an algorithm there that's been selected that was for um, a boosted decision tree uh, as an algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll just just stop there a minute so we can see what, how, how the model has churned our, mm -hmm. our, um, our, uh, our, sorry, as our, how, how our, 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 start again, how our model has predicted whether our customers would churn or, ret or retain or i.e. non-churn, right? Yeah, and as you mentioned, uh, we uh, use the boosted decision tree model. This is one of the out-of-the-box uh, uh, algorithms yep. that, uh, that Azure Machine Learning Studio offers. Uh, but you can also integrate your own custom uh, algorithms as well. So uh, you, can, you can integrate uh, Python and R, uh, your own Python and R uh, modules, uh, which you can use to, uh, to uh, to provide your predictive analytics, fantastic, and we've got some insights in the in the tool here about how uh, how accurate and precise the model is as well. Mm -hmm. So here, here are the uh, additional model, um, algorithm op op options or model options. Yeah, so you can see your different uh, out of the box algorithms here, uh, and you can also see the uh, the custom algorithms here with using Python and R. Uh, and what you can see here is a is is the is a Power BI report which uh, reports out of this of this model. Great. And the point of just showing this is that simply you can connect Power BI straight to the output of this model yeah. uh, and, and and get get the insights in the same medium that you might for the rest of the rest of your insights. Exactly. Cool. So um, probably a lot to take in for uh, quite comprehensive use cases there. Um, start with some data ingestion, modeling, curation, and then serving for finance, analytical reporting. Then we built a web app for some reference data management. Uh, we've we've talked through some use cases for integration. We actually saw somebody create a, a Salesforce.com connection very very quickly. It was just in minutes. Um, and then we, you, you demonstrated well how that could be modeled within um, within or well, the methodology for modeling that within Azure, as an example, with Data Vault. So, um, and finally, then we saw the GUI based um, machine learning um, capability using Azure Machine Learning Studio. So, um, really to sum up, we started today by something simple. We showed what well, we showed you some reports and how we did it. And then we've evolved, we've evolved that and added capability as, as we've gone. We picked up the pace to probably more of a, a run mode. So, um, now time for me to be rejoined by Prashant. Um, coming towards the end of the session. Um, so everything we've seen today, Prashant, completely 100% yep. Azure, right? Yeah, exactly. Everything's built with, this architecture is used or built using platform as service, including velocity. Yeah, and uh, the beauty of this architecture is the scales. So as and when you have more use cases, uh, it automatically scales and you can add more services into it, but you don't need to change the core part, which is this one. 
and as this is PaaS, platform as a service, yeah. we can do this really, really quickly. Um, you can do this on, as long as you've got the permissions to do it. You can stand up these services, take out resources within within your resource group yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah. A few simple clicks. Yeah. And and th this is one again. This is again one example of a mature and a successful reference architecture. But there could be slight variations to this depending on your cost requirements, your volumes, your performance, and response time. And I think we have seen those few vari variations in our previous demos anyway in the different use cases which we had. So, and I think yeah. just something we haven't already mentioned as well is that I think this dispels any any myths that your data platform is just about your data lake. This is about, Absolutely. about, about the, the framework of services around that data lake um, and the process that you implement. Yeah, and these are quick to deliver. Like like in the walk mode for customers, we have delivered this uh, in, in probably less than three months, really. So yeah, yeah, great. OK, thank you very much, Prashant. Thank you for having me, Rob. Thank you all. OK. so. Um, it's now time to, um, we're nearly at the end of the session, so um, just before we go to a Q&A, uh, we're going to hear from one of our customers who's, who's established their Mon Data platform. They've been, on, they've been on the same journey, started two and a half years ago, three years ago, to, took that walk run approach. Um, I'm now joined by Dan. Hi, Dan. Um, Dan's going to walk us through this journey with, with that customer. Hey, so um, let's just um, patch in um, this, this call. Bear with me. Okay, so uh, uh, hi everybody. I'm Dan Barlow. Um, uh, Smith's Group is a is a global company that operates in. Uh, it's been operating for over 170 years with 20 over 20,000 employees um, across 50 countries, split into five different uh, distinct divisions uh, of manufacturing operations. As you can see, space, energy, general industry, security, uh, defense, and medical. If you've not heard of Smiths before, then I think next time you go through security at the airport and put your bags through the scanners, 90% of the time it will say it's Smiths detection on the side of it. I think um, among the many different products that uh, Smiths produce uh, were ventilators from the Ventilator UK Challenge for uh, COVID uh, response. They keep satellites up in, up in space, the Mars rover uh, running around. Uh, planes, planes flying, and uh, keeping our borders and um, and ports secure. So, Ahmed, uh, you've got the the challenge of of being the applications and analytics director for this quite complex and diverse organisation. Thanks for taking the time to uh, your busy schedule to uh, to share your experience uh, with us with the group. Um, hello and, and and welcome, Ahmed. Hi, Dan. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, brilliant. Thank you, Ahmed. So, um, Ahmed, you've got a um, uh, uh, a mature uh, analytics platform now, which is which is great news. Um, can you explain the challenges that um, Smith's group had prior to um, adopting a modern data platform? Um, I think, Dan, to be honest with you, we had uh, a number of challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we had internally is the fact that we have a wide landscape of applications. So uh, we have a number of SAP systems that are different versions, a number of Oracle applications, QAD, uh, if there's an application out there, uh, we probably have uh, had it over the years. Um, and within those applications, we've got different processes for different divisions, different countries, et cetera, et cetera. So we started to build uh, data in silos. Uh, so we had different types of reporting taking place. We had reporting happening in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, we had KPIs that were potentially being assumed in terms of how to structure them and define them. Uh, it was very difficult to try and get a consistent KPI across all different regions, all different divisions, and then report up to group. Um, and essentially, you know, the reality is, that, you know, with a number of ERPs, the data is actually quite difficult to interpret. So people were making assumptions in terms of the data, the data structure what that data means um, and it was down to the analysts in that region uh, to interpret that data. So um, if you like, the challenges were uh, a few um, on that front. Thank you. And in, in what ways did a, a modern data platform um, impact your organisation? I think, you know, throughout the couple of years we started our Azure journey, uh, the reality is now we're able to quickly provide a a, 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 a data point, a KPI to the business to allow them to make a decision. You know, historically, analysts have always spent a lot of time on spreadsheets, trying to churn data, 
and they've spent more time trying to actually extract data, manipulate data and report on that data than actually looking at the data and making decisions from that data. And we've gone away from actually just sort of reporting by actually helping the business to become a data driven organization. Um, you know, a consistent way of reporting across divisions, across group. I think that's helped in terms of, you know, saying this is a defined auditable, auditable controlled way of reporting. Um, uh, and it's, it's easy and efficient for our analysts to have that data available to them to use. So a single source of truth. Yeah, I imagine there's less spreadsheets involved now. Absolutely. Less, less fingers uh, touching the touching the data to uh, exactly. and drive it to an end. And you know, people are starting to see the the opportunities in the data. So they're starting to look at the data and say, OK, you know, um, wow, I've got all this customer data. I can do X, Y, Z with it now quickly and make decisions quickly on that data. Whereas before, you know, it would have been quite a difficult churn and, and people starting to see a different vision for that data. So the reusability of data has become more yeah. apparent with the divisions. Yeah, less point to point analytic uh, solutions. Isn't there? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so um, uh, <clears throat> pardon me. So I'm, I'm guessing that the you must have if you've got um, every ERP system uh, under, under the sun, you've probably got every analytic technology uh, or at least a wide variety of analytic technologies. I'm wondering, did, did, did this provide you an opportunity to um, create a roadmap to consolidate and simplify and save, save costs? Absolutely. I think when we started off our data journey, we didn't quite know how it was going to evolve. We had a, an idea of the directions we wanted to go with, but actually now people are starting to abandon those legacy data warehouse systems that have historically cost us a fortune to maintain uh, to, to actually looking at the, the Azure platform as, 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 as our you know, source of truth. Um, and I think, you know, above and beyond that, um, we've historically had lots of divisions purchase lots of visualization tools and the reality is you know if anybody knows anything about data you know 90 percent of the work is structuring and harmonizing your data and if you get your data right then the 10 percent is the visualization piece um and you know now we've been able to consolidate to a single visualization platform reclaiming some old licenses, reclaiming some old platforms that we weren't using or you obtaining the value we wanted from a visualization perspective. And we're starting to consolidate those as well. And naturally people are moving towards, you know, um, the the standard platform that we're, we're providing today because we've we've actually bought the business on the journey with us um throughout each each process. So the, the so they've actually bought into the idea of using those those platforms now because we can demonstrate the capabilities that are embedded in those platforms. What's the what's the business uh, adoption been like, Ahmed? With uh, so I imagine if if I'm a business user, and I'm I'm used to uh, working up with my my nice friendly uh, analytics tool, and and, um, and and then a new technology comes along. A, a business, are the business team's been, uh, or how have you brought the business along with the journey? I think one of the things that we did at the start of our journey is we, we always thought big, but started off small. And we always tried to demonstrate the value of data and the platform when use cases came along. And, and the important thing is, you know, is not try to over engineer the use cases, but if we can quickly demonstrate, and I mean quickly demonstrate the value of those use cases, to the business, they actually will come on board in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And suddenly they abandon the old tools, which they know were you know, hard to maintain, hard to manage, difficult to extract data, manipulate data, et cetera, et cetera. So we never really try to over engineer everything at the beginning, but show quick value um, and return of value of data to the, to the business. Um, uh, and as we demonstrated that, We've brought more and more people along with our journey, uh, and that's been really a, a key driver to that. So. Great. I think the I think uh, 
small use cases uh, with, with quick value uh, demonstrations uh, is, is the key, isn't it? I think just from you, you read about so many uh, data modernization programs or big data programs that fail. I think some Gartner statistic was like 70 or 80 percent of them uh, big, uh, big data programs fail. And I think, as you said, the com companies sometimes try to bite off more than they can, more than they can chew with an enormous program of work. work. Um, exactly. And that's why we 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 like the, the flexibility that Azure gives us, you know, the fact that we can scale up as and when we need it. You know, we, we always said we're not going to over engineer our use cases, but we're going to engineer them to a point where we can reuse them and evolve them and build on them. And that's what we've been trying to do all the time. So what 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 benefits do you think um, Azure specific? What, 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 well, sorry, what, what do you think are the benefits of Azure specifically? I think the fact that, you know, we have a an enterprise solution for all our data needs in one place. I think that that that's that's a key benefit. The fact that it's a, got an ecosystem that fits in with our ecosystem internally. So I'm using a cloud ecosystem that has all the tools that that is available that meets our ecosystem within Smith as an organization. So what I mean by that is it's easy to integrate in SharePoint. It's easy to integrate with Teams. It's easy to integrate with some of the tools. I have now the ability to connect to ERPs and all the databases I need. Um, I can use AD quite easily and flexibly without, you know, having lots of flaky disconnections, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and the fact that, you know, it's got all unlimited uh, data scale, you know, traditional data warehouses, we used to run out of space and this and that. Obviously, there's the, 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 the ability to also deploy past services when you need them. So, you know, it's it's ultimately the scale and, and uh, the performance that we get from it, but also the ability to connect to our ecosystem. Yeah, elasticity, I think is the, the key word, isn't it? OK, that's yeah. it. And so, <clears throat> so you've got a, a, a mature uh, adoption of an Azure mo uh, modern data platform within your organisation. What advice would you give to another organisation that is considering embarking on this journey? I think, as I said before, you know, don't look at over engineering use cases, look at quick wins that you can bring the business and the stakeholders along with you on the journey. Um, think of evolving your data models. Um, think of version one, version two. Um, think big, but start off small. And I generally mean that, you know, have, have the vision of to do X, Y, Z and, you know, grow the department, grow the people, allow the business to make decisions from your data, et cetera, et cetera. But start off, uh, small and incrementally. Don't try and over engineer it. I think it's important also on a on a practical level that you really do need um, a, a good partner with you on the journey who understands the ecosystem, who understands the platform, has the right skills within that uh, organization and they're able to help and support your teams to educate them and support them on the new tool sets because there is an element of learning um the, the new tools etc cetera, etc cetera. um and and having a good partner to do that throughout the journey is important excellent um ahmed thank you uh, very much for your for your time uh, very much appreciated i'm sure everybody's grateful for your for your insights and, and wisdom uh, from your experience <laughs> thank you very much thanks for having me thank you ahmed Here's all. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for uh, for taking the time out to talk to us about your journey. I'm now rejoined by Prashant. Um, I think we've just got a couple of minutes left uh, in this session then. So yeah. um, probably a good opportunity to field some questions. Um, so if you have any questions from today's session, please pop them into the chat. Um, I've noticed that Fiona has popped a couple of questions in. Thanks, Fiona, for sharing some questions. Um, we're probably worth starting by with, with your first question around benefits um, of having SAP on Azure, um, if at all, uh, and, and whether the, the approaches we've talked through today, you can, you can achieve with your SAP migrated, your infrastructure migrated to Azure, or whether you, whether you don't yeah. need to have done that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if you're not, um, Prashant and I was replying from Dan's machine, so probably if you're wondering how can Dan <laughs> reply while he's talking. So I was doing that, but yeah, as I said in the response, Fiona, uh, uh, if you have your SAP on Azure, uh, it will definitely help in speeding up your ingestion process but uh, if not 
using velocity i think velocity as an architecture is agnostic of where your sap actually sits so you could ingest from an on prem system as well as from a cloud system yeah and, uh, and we we've had this question before as well i mean um, working really closely with the centic team it's really when we talk this through it's really been about what are the specific challenges that you need, that you, your business is looking to overcome and which what is the priority of, of those is it that you're looking to move away from a, um, a legacy infrastructure to a more elastic and scalable infrastructure or are you looking to, to solve specific challenges with your with your data and modernize your data so yeah it, you you can do either in either order it depends on what the business priorities are right yeah yeah okay thanks very much Fiona for, for that question and, and as you asked the second one we'll uh, we'll cover that one too so yeah are there any standard extractors for SAP yeah, okay. SaaS solutions like uh, C4C and success factors? Success factors. Yeah, so uh, this is where we uh, where we said velocity is a complementary to Azure Data Factory. So this is where I would use Data Factory because these are standard SaaS solutions uh, like like uh, a Conquer or a Salesforce, which we earlier demonstrated. They all have APIs which enables you to consume data. And uh, I would just write a data factory pipeline to quickly make a connection to C4C or success factor. And uh, using standard APIs, just start pulling data out into Azure. It has to be in Azure. I mean, uh, you, you would not copy it anywhere else. You would, you would incrementally keep growing it and then drive all your integrations and analytics and, and data science uh, needs through that data, which is in Azure. You, you could also share this data with external users with one with, you know, of the Azure service like Azure Data Share. Uh, but yeah, you would not need to move this data anywhere else. I think this is a place where you drive everything. That's a very valid question. If you had your data uh, SAP on Azure, then uh, we, we could connect directly to that and pull your data out for your on-demand real-time reporting. That's very much a possibility. But ha having all data in one place, uh, what it helps you is, uh, let's say tomorrow a data scientist come and says, hey, I want to access something. Then you really, you really don't want him to directly connect your SAP database, which is serving your ERP needs, wherein he'll start pulling millions and millions of record and could hamper your performance. So you could connect, but I would not advise that. I would suggest bring that down to Azure and then use your data breaks or any other Synapse tool to, uh, to serve your ad hoc querying or reporting needs. Great, yeah. Fiona, thank you for your question. Yeah, and, and, we, and we leave our uh, email ID as well in the chat. So <clears throat> if you have any more questions, feel free to drop us an email and uh, we can always come back with our response. Well, thank you very much, Prashant. Thanks thank everyone you. For, uh, for joining us for this webinar. Um, Richard, thank you. You just popped the uh, the feedback uh, request link into the into this chat. Um, a lot of preparations gone into into this session. Uh, we'd like to make sure that if we do these in the future, they are as the most possible value, maximum value for, for you, you as the audience. So please, if you have thirty seconds, just take take some time to leave that. Um, yeah, great. Thank you all. Thank you everybody. Goodbye.